Hundreds of Detroit area residents lost to the coronavirus pandemic honored this weekend. Photos of faces lining a park drive and families of the victims participating in funeral processions for the services they missed during the pandemic. Deadly divisions, a man from a right wing group in Portland there to support police shot dead in the street. The gunman still at large. Officials from Oregon and Wisconsin slamming the president, faulting him for the violence. Biden fights back. The Democratic challenger hitting the president hard in a fiery speech, condemning the rioters while President Trump says Biden will not keep Americans safe. The campaigns framing the issues in very different ways. America's COVID crisis, more than 6 million confirmed cases, far more than any other country. Schools and college campuses struggling to contain the virus and parents running out of options. Melania Trump's former close friend and trusted advisor pulling back the curtain on who she says the real Melania is. So the Melania I first met versus the Melania there is today is a very different person. Our own Lindsay Davis in an exclusive interview, so-called Operation Block of Arca. A toddler tangled up in a giant kite and swept more than 30 feet into the air. The amazing moment she safely pulled from the sky. And celebrating a hero, the life and legacy of Chadwick Boseman and how his passing has become a wake-up call for so many people when it comes to taking care of our health, especially in this time of COVID. And good evening, everyone. Thank you for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips in for Lindsay Davis tonight. We begin with the political divisions in this country and how clashes between ideologies have escalated into deadly incidents in our city streets. President Trump planning to visit one of the cities that has seen that happen, Kenosha, Wisconsin. The governor saying, in other words, no thanks. In Portland this weekend, a convoy of President Trump supporters clashing with protesters demanding racial justice. Later, the deadly shooting of a man reportedly from a right-wing group. And now there are concerns we'll see another escalation in Wisconsin as the president prepares to visit. Our Alex Perez is there and files this report. President Trump headed to visit with law enforcement in Kenosha tomorrow, a visit the governor and mayor have asked him to reconsider. Amid concerns, the city will see more protest and violence like that seen in Portland overnight. Protesters in Portland blocking traffic and hurling projectiles like these rocks at officers. Officers moving them back with non-lethal ammo. ABC's Kena Whitworth on the ground. Just before 11 o'clock at night here, authorities deemed an unlawful assembly and then the riot control team rush out into the street arresting protesters. From the nearly 30 arrested, police confiscating two handguns. On Saturday, fights breaking out downtown when a caravan of the president's supporters drove through the city, clashing with protesters demanding racial justice. The president retweeting a video of Trump supporters entering Portland, calling them great patriots. This truck spraying people with an irritant. Protesters in its way nearly run over. Witnesses reporting seeing trucks firing paintball guns at protesters. Trump today defending his supporters in Portland. Paint is not, and paint is a defensive mechanism. Paint is not bullets. Later in the evening, this deadly shooting. The gunman fleeing after watching his victim stumble to the ground. The victim wearing a Blue Lives Matter flag and reportedly a hat belonging to a right-wing group. Late today, authorities identifying the victim as 39-year-old Aaron Danielson of Portland. And in Kenosha, officials tonight bracing for the president's planned visit tomorrow amid protests following the police shooting of Jacob Blake and days later, the fatal shooting of two demonstrators, allegedly by 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse. The timing on this, we felt, was not good, and so we did make the request for him to do it at a different time. Seven of the county's 23 board supervisors, however, asking the president to come. The president saying... I am a tremendous fan of law enforcement, and I want to thank the law enforcement. They've done a good job. The White House also adding there are no current plans for President Trump to meet with Jacob Blake's family while he's in Kenosha. Alex Perez joins us now from Kenosha, Wisconsin, where the president is scheduled to be there tomorrow. Alex, we just heard you reporting that there are no plans for the president to meet with Jacob Blake's family. And moments ago, the president was asked why he hasn't spoken to them either. What can you tell us? 
Yeah, Kara, the president says he intended to speak with the family, but that they wanted an attorney on the line when he spoke with them, and that he did not feel that was appropriate. Now, we did reach out to the family spokesperson, and they said they have not heard from anyone with the Trump administration since Friday, and that they were never asked to speak with them. So at this point, they say that they feel it would be too late. So that back and forth really sort of continuing right now, Kira. Alex, thank you. And getting back to those violent protests there in Portland, for more on that, let's get to Kena Whitworth, who you saw there last night. Kena, what is it like to be there within the protests, and do you expect it to escalate again tonight? Well, here I can tell you that last night's protest was unlike any other experience that we have had here in Portland. I have been covering this story for more than a month here, and last night, we entered a protest where my cameraman was attacked, my sound man was attacked, my producer was attacked, I had flashlights, uh, you know, they were shining them right in my eye. We were not wanted there. Uh, we were even pushed to the side. So it was something that we haven't seen before in the protests that we have covered here in Portland. And that protest, I want to point out, was put on by the Pacific Northwest Youth Liberation Front. And they say that they will, in fact, again be protesting tonight and leading the charge. Their battle cry tonight is that the mayor, Ted Wheeler, should resign today. Now, that's very different from the Black Lives Matter protest that we saw a month ago just a few blocks down that way. And we also know that the man who died was wearing this Patriot prayer hat. What else do we know about this group at this point? Well, first, let me say, Kara, he has now been identified. 39-year-old Aaron J. Danielson was murdered here in Portland on Saturday night. Now, I spoke with a Patriot prayer organizer, and this is how he described their group. He said they are focused on grassroots movements to fight for freedom from the government. But they have been described as a far-right group that continuously clashes with protesters here in Portland. And they were part of that caravan of more than 600 cars of Trump supporters that we saw I'll drive through the streets of Portland here on Saturday night. So clearly these are very different from the peaceful protests that we saw a month ago there in Portland. I'm, you're absolutely right when you say that, Kira. I mean, a month ago, there were thousands of people out here. We had the wall of moms, the wall of dads, the wall of vets that were here in support of black lives. They were here to fight for racial justice, and they wanted police reform. And I'm sorry if it's a little loud. There's a big uh, commuter train here going behind me. But it was, and it's important to note that those trains were not able to run because this entire downtown area was shut down during those protests because there were so many people. The park was taken over, but they were having conversations. They wanted to initiate change. And then each night, Kira, we saw the protests go over to the federal building. People were shooting firecrackers at the federal building. It's all really different now. And the governor is hoping that by bringing in the state police, bringing in police from other counties, and creating a forum where the mayor, community leaders, and protest leaders can speak week by week and start to create some real change here in Portland. Well, I'll tell you what, Kana, you and the crew going up a lot uh, against a lot of dangerous elements. We appreciate your reporting. Please stay safe. Thank you so much, Kana. Thank you, Kara. President Trump is planning that trip to Kenosha, even though the mayor and governor have asked him to stay away. Wisconsin, a key battleground state, as the president doubles down on his law and order message. But speaking in Pittsburgh today, Joe Biden argued the president can't stop the violence because he's fueling it. ABC's Terry Moran has the latest now on the clash between the candidates. Joe Biden in Pittsburgh in a rare campaign stop and a blistering speech blasting President Trump for stoking violence and division in America for his own political gain. Fires are burning and we have a president who fans the flames rather than fighting the flames. He can't stop the violence because for years he's fomented it. The Democratic candidate repeated his condemnation of the violence that has broken out in several cities in recent months. Rioting is not protesting. Looting is not protesting. Setting fires is not protesting. None of this is protesting. It's lawlessness, plain and simple. And those who do it should be prosecuted. President Trump tries to portray Joe Biden as a far-left supporter of violence in the streets. Biden shrugging it off. You know me. Ask yourself, do I look like a radical socialist with a soft spot for rioters? Really? 
I want a safe America, safe from COVID, safe from crime and looting, safe from racially motivated violence, safe from bad cops. Let me be crystal clear, safe from four more years of Donald Trump. It is Trump, Biden argued, who is a toxic presence in America and a failed leader. Mr. Trump, you want to talk about fear? Do you know what people are afraid of in America? They're afraid they're going to get COVID. They're afraid they're going to get sick and die. And that is in no small part It's because of you. Late today, the president fired back. We have to stop this horrible left-wing ideology that seems to be permeating our country. And basically, it's weakness. It's weakness on behalf of Democrat politicians. And Terry Moran joins me now. Terry, the president and Joe Biden differing on both substance and style as they engage this issue. What's your sense of who may be most effective in making their case with Americans right now? Yeah, the polls show uh, that this race is tightening, as we all suspected it would, Kira. But I think uh, there's a big difference in, in the pitch, right? President Trump is a storyteller with passion and, and anger. He stokes very powerful emotions. Uh, and Joe Biden, he's essentially offering a return to normalcy. Uh, the question is, does the story that President Trump is telling match the facts in people's lives. And that's really where it's going to come down to it. They see America through the lens of that very vivid, very intense, somewhat frightening uh, story that President Trump is telling about, about where America is and where we'd be going under Joe Biden. He'll win. If it doesn't match the way people are living their lives, he'll lose. Terry, thanks so much. We turn to coronavirus now. The U.S. has surpassed 6 million cases, a quarter of all cases on the planet. The virus is threatening schools, colleges, and even the U.S. Open, which kicked off today. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has the latest. Back to school anxiety at an all-time high. Teachers in Volusia County, Florida, outraged after they say they were told the school district won't tell staff and parents about COVID cases, instead leaving it up to the health department. Parents have the right to know what kind of environment they're sending their students into. Uh, employees have the right to know what kind of working conditions they're going into. While children remain less likely to become sick from the virus, COVID rates among children increased faster this summer than did for the general public. Experts caution, they still don't know why. One of the new members of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, Dr. Scott Atlas, today appearing with the Florida governor, insisting the risks to children are low. We are the only nation among our peer nations that are hysterical about opening schools. But the U.S. today reaching a grim milestone, six million cases among the highest rates in the world. Some colleges already facing a spike in cases. While cities are cracking down, this pool party near the University of South Carolina broken up for mask order violations. Tonight, a struggle to keep the virus out of professional tennis, too. The first Grand Slam event since the pandemic began, the U.S. Open kicking off in New York without fans in the stands. French player Benoit Paire forced to withdraw after testing positive. Posting on Instagram, I'm fine for the moment. I have no symptoms. I hesitate to tell what really happens in this fake bubble. And we're joined now by Eva Pilgrim. So, Eva, what is the U.S. Tennis Association doing to keep players and staff safe at the U.S. Open at this point? Well, Karen, they've created this uh, sort of bubble. They have these players and the coaches in two hotels. When they first arrived, they were tested twice in the first 48 hours, and then every four days they were subject to tests again. The USTA says they are very confident in their safety plan, and they tell us that this player who was tested positive, who was infected, they say that player was not following protocols, Kira. So what else do we know about that study that you mentioned on the rising infection rates among kids? So that study is actually pretty complicated. It does show that there are more cases amongst school-aged children. 
Experts caution, though, that there is still evidence that shows that school age children are less likely to see those severe adverse effects to coronavirus. And, and there's a lot about what they're seeing that they don't understand yet. So this is just more information in the pot of information as they try to understand this virus. Kira. Eva, thanks so much. Now we move to the destruction left in the wake of Hurricane Laura, the deadly storm, one of the fiercest to hit Louisiana, leaving thousands of people without power, water, and any idea when it will all return. Take a look at these two images. This is Lake Charles before Laura struck, and this is Lake Charles now. Trees gone, buildings shattered, blue tarps instead of roofs. Our Victor Akendo is there with more. Tonight in Lake Charles, Louisiana, worry and desperation is growing by the day in the stifling heat. This long line of cars behind me, it stretches for miles. People have been waiting for hours for the basic supplies. The U.S. military is handing out things like ice, water, meals, and tarps. So many here, like Clifton LeBlanc, left with right, like little more than now. incredible We're stories of survival. What are you waiting in line for? Any, anything we can get. Anything you can get? We lost the roof to our house. We've been trapped in our house for four days. Our brother-in-law came and cut us out with a chainsaw yesterday. What was that like? Bad. It was bad. Since making landfall Thursday, Laura claiming at least 18 lives. More than half of those deaths coming from carbon monoxide poisoning from generators. 17,000 linemen from 29 states are here helping restore power, but repairing people's lives is going to take a long time. And back in that line, Randy Foster telling us... These guys and gals make a difference. They're doing their job, but it's a blessing to us. Such heartbreaking stories there. I want to bring in our Victor Akendo now, who's there in Lake Charles. Victor, what are the conditions like for people right now? Kira, simply put, the conditions are brutal. Today alone, expected to be the hottest day of the week. We're not really expecting a cool down anytime soon. At last check, about 350,000 customers are without power. The governor of Louisiana saying they could be in the dark for about three weeks. Kira? Wow, so what resources are available to people who live there at this point? There are a lot of agencies on the ground here right now. You've got the National Guard, the Red Cross, United Way, local charities doing what they can. I just mentioned the heat. There is now a statewide shortage on ice, and we were in one of those distribution lines today. We followed one of those families home, and they told us that when they got there, it was so hot, some of their ice, most of their ice actually, had already melted. Kira? We'll continue to follow the story. Victor, thanks so much. We turn now to the tragic death this weekend of Chadwick Boseman at the age of 43. The gifted actor best known for his lead role in Marvel's Black Panther, as well as films portraying the lives of Jackie Robinson, James Brown, and Thurgood Marshall. According to a statement announcing his death, Boseman filmed several recent roles between, quote, countless surgeries and chemotherapy after he was diagnosed in 2016 with colon cancer. Boseman's hometown city of Anderson, South Carolina, announcing it will hold a memorial service this Thursday. The mayor saying the city will plan for social distancing and saying Bozeman, quote, touched us all with his talent. Well, we want to continue the conversation now about colon cancer and how we can protect ourselves from this silent killer. Dr. Andrea Sersek is an oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center who specializes in this disease and joins us now to continue the conversation. Dr. Sersek, it's so great to see you. And, you know, getting a colonoscopy, it, it's definitely the key first step in detecting and treating colon cancer. We definitely know that. Yet the various experts seem to give us conflicting advice, like the CDC recommends starting these tests at 50. The American Cancer Society says age 45. And then we hear the sad news that Chadwick Boseman died even younger than that at the age of 43. So what do you think? When should we start actually getting colonoscopies? And what early symptoms should we look out for? Yeah, so that's a great question and a, and a very important question, as you pointed out. So bottom line is, colonoscopies can prevent colorectal cancer from developing and they can save lives. And we know that looking at patients in uh, over 50 who have gotten colonoscopies, we've clearly seen a nice decrease in the incidence of colon cancer. 
The issue is that we are seeing a trend of early onset or young onset colorectal cancer. And so cancer in patients under the age of 50, where we are not traditionally recommending screening colonoscopies, has been rising steadily since the mid-1990s. So that's the reason now for this debate as to whether or not we should change screening guidelines. And the American Cancer Society decided that based on, really on computer modeling of this rise in incidence, that we should screen younger than age 50 because with this intervention, we will save lives in that age group. Now, the problem is that the fastest and, and highest rise is actually in individuals age 20 to 30. But even though it's rising and it's actually projected that within this decade, by the end of this decade, about a quarter of all rectal cancers and nearly 10% of all colon cancers are going to be in patients under 50, the numbers are still not large enough to justify changing our guidelines to age 20. So, so, so why the rise in younger patients, as you just mentioned? So we don't know. That, that is, that is a, a huge research question. It's a huge dilemma. It's, it's really what we are all working very, very hard to answer. The initial thoughts were, well, perhaps it's obesity, some of the risk factors that we know have changed in our society, we're more sedentary, our diets have changed. Um, however, that's really not the population that we see uh, in our a large cancer center. We've looked at this at Memorial and others have looked as well. And, and these patients really are not obese. They're active, they're fit. Um, they, they don't quite fit this profile of, of what you would consider high risk. So there's something else that is causing this uh, rise in incidence. And it actually happens to be a global phenomenon. It's not just across the United States. It's occurring worldwide. We also don't talk about it a lot. You know, it's the second most common cause of cancer deaths in the United States. So why don't we talk about it more? I think it's important to, you know, I don't know why I'm a, I'm a colon cancer doctor. I talk about it all day long. I tell anyone who wants to listen. Um, and as you said, it's, it's, it's the second most uh, uh, common cause of death. Uh, and it is preventable. And, and if uh, you had mentioned earlier, if we pay attention to our symptoms, I think that is key for young individuals under the age of 45. If you have persistent symptoms, speak to your care provider, get a colonoscopy if necessary. And symptoms would include things like bleeding. Um, a lot of the tumors are rectal, as I mentioned. So people present with rectal bleeding, bloating, abdominal pain, change in bowel habits, uh, unexplained weight loss and fatigue. Those are all important things to discuss with your, your care provider if you're, if you're seeing these changes and they're not kind of just transient lasting a few days. And I think it's fair to say, you know, it's a very uncomfortable thing to talk about, right? We need to be more blunt and more open about this as uncomfortable as it may be, right? Absolutely. I mean, there's nothing, it's, it's an organ just like any other. It's a procedure that you get it over with and it's important. And, and, you know, once we kind of continue this conversation and say, look, just get it done. You'll see that it's, it's really easy. It's not such a big deal. Um, more people hopefully will, will be aware and, and will get, will get colonoscopies. And, and the black community is disproportionately affected by colon cancer. Uh, how can we best address this disparity? Yeah, so this is a difficult situation. So we know that the in the black community, the incidence is higher and the mortality is higher from colorectal cancer. What we don't know is, is this a different biology? Do they have more aggressive disease or is it simply access to care? So I think it's the same thing, getting the word out um, um, to the communities, to the care providers, internists, gastroenterologists, that this is something that really must happen age 45 and older, and if in younger individuals, if there are any concerning symptoms, it's really something that, that has to be addressed. Great advice. Dr. Andrea Sursek, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for having me. And when we come back, Melania Trump's former friend and advisor talks exclusively to our very own Lindsey Davis about life inside the White House and the behind the scenes battle between the First Lady and Ivanka. And is the future here? We'll see transportation and how it's being taken to the next level. And guess which 90s sitcom is reuniting? Just sit right there and we'll tell you all about it. Now this is a story all about how my life got flipped. Powerful stories of our time. 
anytime. Nightline. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smart not. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin. Just give it to me straight. Straightforward news. Straight to the heart of the story. ABC News. Straightforward. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail. David. David. see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank, Thank you for sitting. Now, with so much on the line, ABC News, America's number one news, is right there for you live on Hulu with stories of strength, stories of hope. Because now, when it matters most, Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. And that news is ABC News. ABC News Live on Hulu. ABC News Live on Hulu. Watch the news you need. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Streaming to all Hulu subscribers right now. Mother Nature setting the rules, and all I got to do is slay her game. It happened so quick. New season of Life Below Zero, followed by the premiere of Next Generation, Monday, September 7th at 8 on National Geographic. And that's Trump's senior advisor, Jared Kushner, seen giving a speech earlier today on a runway in Abu Dhabi after partaking in the first ever commercial flight between Israel and the UAE. That flight represents a major step in moving relations forward between the nations since a U.S. brokered deal earlier this month to open diplomatic ties. Kushner thanks Saudi Arabia for letting the American-Israeli delegation fly through their airspace, airspace rather, and said he hopes this flight will be the first of many between the countries. Liberty University announcing today it has opened an independent investigation into Jerry Falwell's time as its president. The Evangelical School Board saying in a statement that it will investigate all facets of the school's operations under Falwell, including financial and legal matters. Falwell resigned last week after allegations of a sex scandal among Falwell's wife, Becky, and a former business partner, Giancarlo Granda. Granda claiming that Jerry Falwell was aware of the affair and even witnessed the sexual relationship. The Falwells have acknowledged the affair but denied Jerry Falwell participated and claim they were being extorted. The Falwells telling me tonight they welcome any inquiry by Liberty's board and, quote, have nothing to hide. And now to our exclusive interview with Melania Trump's former close friend and confidant, Stephanie Winston Wolkoff, who's out with a new book, Melania and Me, sat down with our very own Lindsay Davis and talked about her life in the White House and what she describes as a behind the scenes battle between the first lady and Ivanka Trump. I gave Melania the benefit of the doubt that she was my friend. She was different than the Donald was. She was different than the other Trump children. And so, now? Oh. A Trump is a Trump is a Trump. This morning, Stephanie Winston Walkoff, the former close friend, confidant, and trusted advisor to the First Lady, is pulling back the curtain on who she says the real Melania Trump is in her new book, Melania and Me. You talk about how Melania prizes her privacy above all things. Give us a, a sense of the woman you came to know a, as a friend for, for quite some time. Melania and I first met when I was at Vogue. And she, it was before she had met Donald. She was single, she was striving, she wasn't you know, a Vogue cover model yet. So the Melania I first met versus the Melania there is today is a very different person. Before their bitter fallout over Stephanie's role in what became the most expensive inauguration in history, they were close friends for more than a decade. 15 years of friendship, you all had kind of like a, a fun girlfriend, whimsical times, right? With mm -hmm. selfies and duck lips and lunches. What attracted me to Melania is her strength, her independence, her doesn't matter what anybody else thinks attitude. I mean, she told you on her jacket, I don't care. She doesn't care what anyone thinks about her. That's true confidence. 
That strength is something Stephanie says was on full display after the Access Hollywood tape came out, a moment many thought would derail Donald Trump's run for president. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. <laughs> Grab him by the <laughs> I can do anything. The day that the Access Hollywood tape came out, she had reached out to me to have lunch. Now, if any other human being or any other one of my friends, I would have expected to see them in tears, right? She was smiling. It was as if nothing happened. And I swear to you, I had like a glitch in my brain. And because I was like, is this really happening at this moment? Is it surreal that her husband just came out and said these horrible things? And I said to her, how many times have you heard the word and president in the same sentence? And we burst out laughing. But then I said to her, are you upset though? You know, and doesn't this get you angry that Donald would s say something like this? And Melania's a pragmatist. Melania always, you know, if you can't control people's emotions, then why even worry about it? And that's how she lived her life. And it, that is what she stood by every day. That that was the only time that there was even a possibility that Donald wouldn't win the election was because of his tape that had come out. I've just received a call from Secretary Clinton. After Donald Trump's victory in the 2016 election, Stephanie says Melania and the newly minted president turned to her for help. For years, Stephanie was Anna Winter's go-to woman. She produced the star-studded Met Gala for a decade. And now Stephanie was being tapped to play a key role in both the First Lady's office and the planning of the inauguration. In her book, she alleges a backstabbing and competitive relationship between Melania and her stepdaughter, Ivanka, even quoting the First Lady as calling Ivanka the princess. Stephanie says Ivanka approached her to make sure she was placed prominently next to her father when President Trump was sworn into office. You don't do that to the First Lady of the United States of America. You do not try and position yourself more important. And Melania was not having that. She looked at me and she said, you mean who, princess? And we both started laughing hysterically because Ivanka turned into a princess who wanted to be queen. Operation Block Ivanka. Explain that. When I spoke with Melania about the picture itself, we figured out how to make sure that Barron was in between Donald and Melania and that to Melania's right would be Donald Jr. and that Ivanka would be next keeping Ivanka blocked from the historic photo. Stephanie says she has proof to back up her stories. I can back up everything that's in the book, 100%. With audio tapes? I can back up the book. There's nothing in the book that I can't back up, not one word. And Donald and Melania know that. You've said that, that she and Donald are the perfect match. Before Donald and Melania got married, he made it very explicit that he did not want to have a wife that wanted to be in the spotlight as much as he did, like Ivana and Marla. And Melania obliged to that. And it's what does make their marriage work for them. People have always said that they don't think that Melania wanted him to win, but, but you say otherwise. Melania felt it was just as much a victory for her as it was for him. Early on in um, the administration, there were a lot of the public perceptions were about like free Melania or, you know, they'd see her appear to, to not hold hands with the president. I, I just want to clear up the free Melania, hashtag free Melania. Um, the, the, the backstory to that is, um, you know, a picture says a thousand words, but this one got it totally wrong. Um, when Donald had turned around to look at Melania and as he was turning away and the camera captured her, while her face being while he was being day, sworn yeah. in, um, Barron had accidentally kicked her ankle. And in that second, she was jabbed and it hurt. And so she grew like it, it was a, it was a look of pain. It wasn't a look of disgust. And so as her friend, you know, after all of this was coming out, I said, Molly, why don't you tell everyone that that's what happened? I mean, that's what happens with our kids. Um, and nope, she, and as her advisor, I said, I think it's really important that you tell people what happened because it's not that big of a deal. But what makes Melania Melania is the mystery, right? Everyone wants to know who this woman is. So by remaining mysterious and not telling the public that something so natural and normal happened, it keeps the mystery alive, right? She's put up this steel barrier around her and it's, she's maintained her privacy and no one's getting in. So the Melania I know, right, as, as unflappable as she can appear and as, um, you know, there is emotion and there are things, that, but 
she doesn't want anyone to, to create her story. Stephanie says her loyalty to Melania was her Achilles heel and that their relationship soured when she says she became the scapegoat for what became by far the most expensive inauguration in history, costing $104 million, so prompting a, investigations. So now it's a tremendous honor to have the first dance with Melania. In February 2018, press reports questioned how much money Stephanie had made for her work on the inauguration. For the record, she says after payments to vendors, she personally made $480,000. She says she was devastated when Melania did not publicly support her. When the time came where I needed her to come out and tell the truth about that, she honestly, she folded like a deck of cards. Stephanie says she questioned many inauguration expenditures. I think when I saw that a tree was, you know, a tree that you could buy for $10 was $1,000, or a stage that would cost $100,000 was a million dollars. I mean, those are when things started seeming um, questionable to me. She says she's still working with three criminal investigations into inauguration spending. The Presidential Inauguration Committee says it disagrees with Stephanie's characterizations of this historic event. The uproar over inauguration spending also brought to a close Stephanie's work as an unpaid advisor to Melania and their friendship. If Melania were sitting in the room right now, what would you say to her? Look, I think Melania is going to have mixed feelings after reading this book. And I think it's going to hurt because it all speaks for itself. The First Lady's team responding saying the book is full of mistruths and paranoia. And thanks to our Lindsay Davis for that. We still have more ahead here on Prime, including those terrifying moments for a toddler pulled away by a kite and the loss of a titan in the sports world. Coach John Thompson's incredible impact. You might have heard about today's big stock splits on Wall Street, but what's really behind Tesla and Apple's major moves today? Stay with us. In times like these, the newsmaking events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face to face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong Un. The president. You trust him? I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We turn now to one of America's most innovative companies, the electric car and clean energy giant Tesla. Today, the company completed what's called a stock split, creating more publicly available shares of its stock for a cheaper price. We take a look now at what that means by the numbers. $2,213 was the price of just one share of Tesla stock on Friday before today's five for one stock split. Now you can buy a Tesla share for the more modest price of $498, but that means you'll own a smaller percent of the company than if you bought a single share last week. Tesla shares soared nearly 13% today as investors scooped up these more affordable stocks. And Tesla CEO Elon Musk became $10.4 billion richer since late Friday. Musk's net worth is now $103 billion, making him the fifth richest person on the planet. That's according to Forbes, which reports that he's quadrupled his wealth since mid-March. And another major innovator split its stock today, that was Apple. Its four for one stock split means you can now buy one share for $129. And we come back, we'll have an in-depth report on the massive protests in Belarus and the Amber Alert for a one-year-old in Georgia, the terrifying moments the baby was taken from his mother at gunpoint. And our interview with George Mason University's first ever black president and how he's taking a stand against racism. But first, look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Part of 
the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. Let's do it right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. This afternoon, Joe Biden taking President Trump to task in the battleground state of Pennsylvania, criticizing the president's response to the recent unrest in Kenosha following the shooting of Jacob Blake by a police officer. Biden also calling out rioting and looting. I want to make it absolutely clear, something very clear about all of this. Rioting is not protesting. Looting is not protesting. Biden taking time to note the president's lack of response to public outrage over Kyle Rittenhouse, the 17-year-old Trump supporter charged with shooting three people, two of whom died during protests last week. So far, President Trump has refused to condemn his actions. He was trying to get away from them, I guess, it looks like, and he fell, and then they very violently attacked him. And it was something that we're looking at right now, and it's under investigation. Meanwhile, the White House is defending President Trump's planned trip to Kenosha tomorrow. He's scheduled to meet with local law enforcement officials there, though he is not scheduled to meet with the family of Jacob Blake. Another grim milestone in the coronavirus pandemic. More than 25 million people around the world have now been diagnosed with COVID-19. According to the latest data from Johns Hopkins University, the virus has now killed more than 840,000 people worldwide. The U.S. has more cases and deaths than any other country. Around 6 million Americans have been infected with the virus and more than 180,000 have died. Students returning to college campuses are facing new outbreaks. Dr. Deborah Burks is warning students who become sick to stay where they are. Do not not return home if you're positive and spread the virus to your family, your aunts, your uncles, your grandparents. And in the sports world, a U.S. Open tennis player tested positive as the tournament gets underway today. While video out of Taiwan, we want to let you know right away that the child in this video is okay. The three-year-old, yes, that's a three-year-old, swept over 30 feet into the air after getting tangled in the strings of a giant orange kite at a festival on Sunday. The little girl twisting several times in the air as shocked onlookers rushed to help her. Her parents say she was shaken by the unexpected flight. I would think so, but thankfully, she was not injured. Officials stopped the kite festival after this incident. Forget same-day delivery. How about same hour? That future waiting in the wings with Amazon's Prime Air service. The FAA gave the e-tailer a crucial seal of approval. Amazon's drones can begin delivery trials. Now for years, the company has said it plans to use drones to make deliveries in 30 minutes or less. Amazon says it has test centers around the world and has logged thousands of flight hours so far. Amazon faces competition in the skies. Google's parent company Alphabet also received FAA approval for its operator, Dub wing. The same for UPS. They're calling theirs Flight Forward. A flying car has passed a big test in Japan. The battery-powered car circled the field for about four minutes with a pilot on board. The startup company hopes to get this car on the market by 2023, but it could take longer. They still have some major hurdles to overcome, including safety issues. The car could end up selling for between $300,000 to $500,000. Now this is the story all about how The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is getting a reboot. The cast is reuniting on HBO Max to celebrate the show's 30th anniversary. Will Smith will be there, joined by his co-stars. The hit sitcom ran on NBC from 1990 to 1996. Variety reports taping will begin September 10th and will air sometime around Thanksgiving. 
Now to this Amber Alert in Georgia after a one-year-old boy was kidnapped from his stroller by attackers who tried to hold the baby's mother at gunpoint. Tonight, the baby is safely back in his mother's arms. ABC's Steve Osinsami is in Atlanta with more. Police in suburban Atlanta tonight are sharing this dash camera video of a child rescue on Saturday afternoon, the moment they took down two people accused of stealing a woman's baby who police found unharmed inside this red SUV. Results like this usually does not happen, and the percentage is very low. So we thank God for that. They say that the married couple were total strangers and made it 70 miles away with the child. Maynor and Kristen Valera Zuniga are charged with kidnapping, aggravated assault, and battery. They appeared in court today but have not yet entered a plea. The child, one-year-old Mateo Montufar Barrera, was at today's briefing with his family. It feels great. It feels comforting that he's finally home. The child's mother, who's asking for privacy, was out walking with the baby in a stroller when she says a man got out of a red SUV and pointed a gun at her. She fought so hard, police say she ripped off this piece of his pants and was able to grab this shoe and even grabbed the man's gun and fired off shots as he and a woman in the passenger seat took off with her child. Police believe this same couple may have tried to kidnap another baby at this same location. Witnesses tell authorities that just 10 minutes earlier, a couple was seen trying to snatch a baby from a young woman's arms, but that mother was able to get away with her child. She did not call authorities, and authorities tonight are asking her to do so. Kira? Steve, thanks so much. Well, tonight, the crisis in Belarus still unfolding following more massive protests demanding that President Lukashenko resign. But authorities also now increasing the pressure with a heavy security presence on the streets of the capital over the weekend. Our Patrick Revel is on location with more. An image of the divide in Belarus, a massive, peaceful crowd of protesters confronting a wall of undisguised authoritarian power. For the third weekend running, over 100,000 people flooding the capital Minsk on Sunday to demand an end to the rule of Alexander Lukashenko in power for 26 years. You can see people are starting now to move into the city center, but all around here there are big loads of army trucks, some troops as well. And so the atmosphere right now is pretty festive as it has been, but at the same time there's a much bigger security presence here. Hundreds of troops and riot police moving to block the protesters, even military armored vehicles deployed as a show of force. We're really seeing two Belaruses here. On this side, the protesters, like a street party, and then on this side, the riot police blocking their path. Sunday was Lukashenko's 66th birthday, and the protesters framed the demonstration as an unwanted party for him. And the atmosphere was like a carnival. Protesters again celebrating their sense of strength. Some demonstrators now intervening to drag others away from plainclothes police. But there was also no sign the security forces' loyalty to Lukashenko is weakening. Lukashenko himself has rejected negotiations with the opposition, last week brandishing an assault rifle in front of cameras. And now he has the clear backing of Russia. This week, President Vladimir Putin warning Moscow could intervene if protesters seek to violently topple Lukashenko, saying he's created a reserve of Russian security forces to send if necessary. But we also agreed that it would not be used, so long as the situation doesn't get out of control. Protesters show no indication of crossing the line into violence, so peaceful they even obey stoplights. During the week, the uprising almost seems to go on pause. The protests much smaller as authorities also up the pressure. This week, they detained dozens of people. But then Sunday comes. Uh, sometimes we think that we lose again, something like this. But after every weekend, I feel like... One of the women who's found herself at the head of the protests, Maria Kolesnikova, again at Sunday's march, showed no sign of doubt. It's been three weeks now, and obviously they're still blocking you, and they're not stepping down, do you think? No, of course, it will not. Uh, uh, till victory, it will not stop down. We are ready to go for the victory, and uh, it takes a lot of time and energy, but we are ready. The opposition now is seeking to keep the pressure up also through other means, calling for more strikes and boycotts. But for now, the contest feels in the balance. The crisis here clearly far from over but how it ends, deeply uncertain.
Minsk was quiet today as it has been after the other big protests, but police did disperse a small demonstration not far from here and authorities detained two local opposition leaders. There's no sense that the protests are fading away, but at the same time, Alexander Lukashenko's grip on power for now feels strong. Kira. Our thanks to Patrick. Now to the passing of a legend in the world of basketball. Former Georgetown Hoyas coach John Thompson Jr. has died. Thompson built Georgetown into a college powerhouse with three final four appearances in the 1980s and in 1984 became the first black coach to lead his team to a Division I NCAA championship. Some of his players would go on to be NBA greats from Patrick Ewing to Alonzo Mourning to Dikembe Mutombo and to Allen Iverson. Iverson even tweeting today, thanks for saving my life, coach, with Thompson known throughout his career as a mentor and fierce advocate for black athletes and coaches who followed in his footsteps. John Thompson Jr. was 78 years old. He will truly be missed. As thousands of people rallied for racial justice at the Lincoln Memorial last Friday across the Potomac River in Northern Virginia, students at George Mason University, now back on campus during the pandemic, were raising their voices of solidarity. And the school's first ever black president is taking a stand against racism while navigating the complicated history of the school's namesake. ABC's Devin Dwyer has the story tonight. The students are back on campus and calling for racial justice. I just want to see more actions just taken on campus toward um, Black Lives Matter. George Mason University in Virginia, like many across America, transformed by a summer of protests and COVID-19. Masks are mandatory, social distance enforced in classrooms, and student meals now delivered by robots. Not even a delivery guy. Not even a delivery guy. And, um, you know, it also will say thank you very much. The school, the largest and most diverse public university in Virginia, is also overhauling how it handles issues of race. We want to be a national leader in the discussion of how campuses should be structured, how they should operate, and how they should perform relative to race. <laughs> Dr. Gregory Washington this summer became George Mason's first African-American president and one of just 8% of university presidents nationwide who are black. His history-making appointment coming just as the pandemic, recession, and protests against racism collided at once. To be honest with you, don't know if I would have took the job knowing what I know now. I mean, this is... Uh, this is a tough environment. One major challenge addressing questions about the school's namesake, George Mason, a founding father who helped inspire the Bill of Rights, but who also owned 100 slaves, most of them children. Mason was one of the biggest slave owners in Virginia. Did you ever consider dropping George Mason? So, so this is an interesting uh, debate. This is a part of the American story. And we can't separate George Mason from this institution no easier than we can separate many of the founding fathers from the country uh, because a significant percentage, a large percentage of them own slaves. Washington says the school will keep its name, arguing the founding fathers should be treated differently than Confederate leaders whose statues have been defaced and torn down as symbols of hate. I don't think by him owning slaves has made its way to the campus. We're all diverse, we're all one. Until recently, that history had been overlooked. In 2017, a team of undergraduate researchers uncovered new details about the lives of Mason slaves, prompting a reckoning on campus. But instead of removing a monument to Mason, the school decided to construct a memorial to the enslaved people he owned. I really love the monument that is being built because it provides the whole picture of the story. We just had the statue and didn't really know the history behind everything. But now with that being built, you can look at the history and look through all of that and see the statue. And now the university's new president going even further, creating an anti-racism task force to investigate lingering racial bias at the school and root it out, actively monitoring police activity, reviewing salary and promotion policies, adding counselors for racial healing, and requiring every course syllabus to include a statement against racism. In a time of national unrest related to racial inequities, uh, I, you know, my message would be one of, look, great things are still possible.
A call for optimism as the nation grapples with yet another police shooting of an unarmed black man, Jacob Blake in Wisconsin, an incident unsettling students hundreds of miles away. I mean, it's sad. It's sad to see people that look like me, like, dying on the streets because of something that they can't control. But I think at the moment what we need in the country right now is unity because at the moment it seems like we're very divided. As the March for Justice, Equality and Unity goes on, students back on campus during this pandemic making clear their voices aren't going away. But I feel like the protests are a good thing. They're showing that we want to fight for what we believe is right and um, it shouldn't take for an African-American male or female to be killed for us to protest for what we know is right. For ABC News Live, I'm Devin Dwyer in Fairfax, Virginia. And when we come back, we'll celebrate the life and legacy of Chadwick Boseman. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor, overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. was Chadwick Boseman, the actor who lost his very private battle with cancer at 43 years old. Tributes pouring in from all over the world, honoring the life and legacy of the Black Panther star, including some beautiful words from his Marvel co-stars. Our TJ Holmes has more. Chadwick Boseman as Black Panther was a superhero who took a whole generation of kids and kids at heart into a brave new world. Wakanda forever! One that was the center of so much excitement. Bozeman was on GMA before the movie opened. With all this fanfare and all these things, we always look at the big picture, but you're in the middle of this storm. How does it feel for you? Oh, this thing is taking on its own life. <laughs> like, it's, 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 it's amazing. It's amazing to watch how excited people are. It's amazing to see these little Black Panthers. <laughs> Black Panther director Ryan Coogler saying in a statement, he was a special person. We would often speak about heritage and what it means to be African. When preparing for the film, he would ponder every decision, every choice, not just for how it would reflect on himself, but how those choices could reverberate. They not ready for this. What we're doing, this is Star Wars. This is Lord of the Rings, but for us and bigger. Black Panther co-star Forrest Whitaker talking to Robin Sunday night about a pivotal scene where Bozeman's character is crowned king. There was energy coming with stuff. Uh, that as if there was a transformation that was going on. Mm. And I, I thought that was uh, really powerful that he was being empowered, that it was actually happening. And I think um, it's that kind of discipline but openness yeah. uh, that allowed part of the phenomenon of, of Black Panther to occur, like all the different things that happened from what he did. It was sort of a inspiring people to believe in it and to remember their heritage and their lineage and ancestry and the beauty and of the uh, black culture. Avengers co-star Robert Downey Jr. saying this to Robin about being on set with Bozeman. Toward the end of the, the third Avengers, the uh, Infinity War, there is this uh, we all kind of lose together. And I remember it was one of those few days that all of the uh, all of the Avengers were were together, and um, it was just the way that he walked on set and the immense success that had occurred, and rightfully so, with Black Panther. And uh, he was just in this kind of stratus of his own, and uh, but always, always humble, always hardworking, 
always a smile on his face and uh, and just and now looking back all the more I realize just what an incredibly graceful human mm. being it was. Walt Disney Company executive chairman Bob Iger saying I don't think people appreciated just how great he was while he was living and while it's exhilarating to hear all these great things being said and written about him uh, it's only my hope that he would have heard them while he was still with us. And thanks to our TJ Holmes. But before we go tonight, our image of the day. Seven-year-old Max with a solemn Wakanda salute in honor of Bozeman. Max's mom actually says he took the news about Black Panther going to heaven easier than she expected and added that it was me who needed a little extra time to process his passing. That's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Kira Phillips. Thanks so much for streaming with us and have a great night.